Let's break down NASCAR driver walkout songs at Bristol. NASCAR needs Goodyear to be better. Plus, IndyCar has charters now. Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. Has everybody calmed down from the Bristol night race yet? I saw I got a 27% and then it was it a good race poll by Jeff Gluck, a abysmal rating for for Bristol, but we are headed to Kansas this weekend. One of the NASCAR Cup Series best track for the Gen 7 car gave us the closest finish ever in NASCAR Cup Series history back in the spring. One one thousandth of a second between Kyle Larson and Chris Buescher. So maybe it'll make people forget about what we saw the past weekend in Bristol. We shouldn't forget about that, though, the same way we shouldn't forget about the fact that Bristol gives drivers the opportunity to have a walkout song for driver introductions for the Bristol night race. And generally, there's some pretty good selections. So let's go through this year's list, starting off with, I think, the winner of the night, in my opinion, that being Austin Dillon picking Move Bitch by Ludacris, an absolutely phenomenal pick. I didn't think that he was self-aware to do that. I didn't think he was creative enough. Maybe it was his PR team that did it. Somebody said that he did it at Michigan um, a couple weeks ago. I think that was probably more of the track than Austin Dillon picking that. But either way, phenomenal pick by him. I don't think he's knocking anybody's lights out anytime soon, but it is a pretty self-aware pick. Probably had Joey Logano looking over his shoulder when he heard that come on. Is Todd Gillen married to a model? Either way, he doesn't want to get bleached on his t-shirt. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and give Father Stretch My Hands Part 1 a listen by Kanye West. You'll understand. Alex Bowman picks Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes, specifically the Glitch Mob remix. Seven Nation Army, Alex Bowman rumored to go to the seven car. Does that mean Alex Bowman's going to the seven car in 2026? I don't know. Alex, please respond. Brad Keselowski picked I'm Different, but not the two chains one. Pull up to the scene. My roof gone. No, Brad, you're in the US cellular convertible once again. No, instead he picked I'm Different by Randy Newman. You're probably wondering who the F is Randy Newman? He's the guy that created all the Pixar songs. And as soon as you look at his Spotify page, you're going to be like, oh, this guy? This guy makes absolute bangers. He's got 4.2 million monthly listeners. Brad Keselowski has a lot of kids. That's why. Corey LaJoy picked Thunderstruck by ACDC, which is pretty on brand for him considering one to five drivers every single weekend seem to get Thunderstruck by Corey LaJoy during the race. Josh Blicky picked Magic Carpet Ride by Steppenwolf, and he probably wishes he had a Magic Carpet on Saturday night at Bristol because that 66 Arby's Meat Wagon just was not fast whatsoever. Denny Hamlin is kind of like the Drake of NASCAR, not in the Kendrick Lamar battle rap, what Kendrick said about him. That's actually bad. More in the sense that he wishes he could play basketball, like Drake wanted to play at Kentucky and just never could, but I'll sit in on the meet meeting where the warmups and brick every uh, warm-up shot he gets. Denny Hamlin really wanted to play basketball. He picked Serious by the Alan Parsons Project just to suck up to his team owner, Denny Hamlin. If you're not familiar with what Serious by the Alan Parsons Project is, it's that iconic Chicago Bulls intro music from back in the 90s. Eric Jones went from Rollin' by Limp Biscuit last year to How Do You Like Me Now by Toby Keith. That's a heck of a glow up in just the course of 12 months. It's like saying, oh, I like Fight Club a lot, and then coming back the next year and be like, I really enjoy Dances with Wolves. What? How did we get here? Ryan Priest's mom always told him he was born on the wild side. Case in point, Daytona Summer Race 2023 when he went for one heck of a tumble and showed up the next week with his eyes bloodshot like he was Davey Allison. He went ahead and picked Ride the Lightning by Warren Zeters. Bubba Wallace once again sending a message with the song that he selected. He picked it last year. He picked it again this year. That would be Tyler Childers' Long Violent History. Some of the lyrics here, quote, that's updated footage, wild speculation, tall tales, hearsay, and absolute lies been passed off as factual. If you know, you know, you know exactly what Bubba Wallace is referring to here. Austin Cindric picked Goofy Goober Rock by SpongeBob SquarePants for the second year in a row, and that very much just fits Austin Cindric. He's off to explore the wilderness. Daniel Suarez picked El Mariachi Loco on brand. That one checks out. For the second year in a row, Christopher Bell picked Remember the Name by Fort Minor, which I think only he and J.J. Watt are fans of that song. However, the people on TikTok seem to really like that song. Maybe I'm just a hater in this situation. A lot of people on TikTok asked who Ryan Blaney selected. He picked No One Else Like Me by Red Clay Strays. Ty Gibbs actually deserves a shout out because on the selection sheet that Bob Hawkers posted, it said that he had selected Cumberland Gap by David Rawlings. Instead, somebody at the track told me that he selected Put On by Jeezy, which that's a phenomenal top tier pick. Daniel Hemmerk selected the Gummy Bear song by, well, Gummy Bear. I have no idea what that is. I assume it's because he has kids. I went ahead and listened to it on Spotify. Now I can't get it out of my head. Like, what does the Fox say? It's kind of along the same things. You're going to get stuck listening to it. Also, for a second year in a row, 
Carson Hosovar brought in a pretty good pick. This year he picked Narco by Blast Jacks and Timmy Trumpet. Top tier selection from him as well. Overall, pretty standard selections. He had a decent amount of Zach Bryan, a lot of Hardy, a lot of Morgan Wallen. Today's video is sponsored by Lockdown Brand. Head over to LockdownBrand.com today for your motorsports inspired apparel. Their shirts are absolutely phenomenal. Their hats equally as great. Use code BREAKHARD10 at checkout to save 10%. Also, do not forget that there is now a Break Hard blog as well. I'm posting about two to three times a week. I will have my Monday morning cooldown lap out on on Monday morning. So go ahead and sign up. You have it delivered to your inbox by clicking the link that is down in the description below. All right, now going back to something we talked about in the intro to this video, we cannot forget just how poorly the Bristol night race was. Yes, Kyle Larson went out there and dominated. That happens from time to time. Not every race is a banger. Completely understand that. Sometimes teams just absolutely nail the setup. And that's what Kyle Larson, that five team did on, on Saturday night. At the same time, though, there's a lot of frustrations, I think, with, with Goodyear, probably from the teams and from the fans as well. And NASCAR needs Goodyear to do better because what we got this weekend wasn't what anybody was expecting. They need to figure it out in a sense. So if you remember back in the spring race, the Bristol spring race, Goodyear brought a tire that wore out in 40 laps, unintentionally, unintentionally brought a tire that wore out in 40 to 50 ish laps. So we're talking 20 to 20 to 30 miles, essentially when these tires were, were courting. They bring that same tire back to a summer test uh, a few weeks, months ago at this point, 90 degrees out that day. They recreated the same problem. OK, so it's not dependent on ambient air temperature. It's not dependent on the you know, track temperature. It's seemingly, they bring it back on Saturday night in the Bristol night race. Same tire, according to them. Put your tinfoil hat on if you don't believe it. And they did not wear out at all. In fact, they went 200 plus laps and had very little to no fall off for the most part. And it left a lot of people, I think, frustrated from the fans as well as from the teams because Brad Keselowski team explicitly said that they set up their car for a high wear race. Same with Daniel Suarez and they did not get a high wear race out of this tire and basically doomed their nights. They had no speed whatsoever. Daniel Suarez four laps down at the end of that race. And essentially it's got everybody sitting around looking like Big Cat in the MAC championship being like, figure it out because this is just not acceptable at this point. And Goodyear in 2024 has had an up and down track record. And you remember back a couple weeks ago at Watkins Glen, they were supposed to be bringing a tire that had three seconds of fall off over the course of a run. Not sure we ever saw that three seconds. And that was a very hyped about tire. Yeah, what they brought to Richmond was actually really good. Made Richmond entertaining uh, for the first time in quite some time, probably to the casual fan. That option tire worked really well there. But now we find out this past week that Phoenix is getting the same hard tire that it had back in the spring. So you know that the championship race is probably going to be a bit of a snoozer barring something crazy happening. Martinsville is getting the option tire, the softest tire that they have. So maybe that'll be fun. But man, at the same time, it's just like, what is happening here? We need them to bring a consistent tire, a tire that does wear out. And don't get me wrong. These teams are incredibly smart. They'll be able to adjust the setups after the first time bringing that tire more than likely to cut down on the amount of tire wear. But what we've been getting out of Goodyear just hasn't been working. And I understand it. They have a very difficult job. On one hand, they can't have tires blowing out every eight to 10 laps like it's Indianapolis 2008. On the other hand, they can't keep bringing these Fred Flintstone specials that don't wear out over the course of 200 plus laps. They have to protect the brand. I understand that because if they have a tire that blows out, that makes headlines, uh, especially, you know, a plethora of tires that blow out. That makes headlines. And then people think that, oh, man, Goodyear can't even build a tire for race cars. Why would I buy Goodyear tires for the road? So they need to find this fine balance. But what we have right now it's just so hit or miss every time we go to the racetrack. Yeah, we're not getting a thousand horsepower. And yeah, we know that the Gen 7 car is flawed. It, uh, I mean, really just super flawed on short tracks. It races pretty well on intermediate tracks, super speedways, whatever. Road courses, it's too good for road courses, honestly. But Watkins Glen was an entertaining race. So the road courses this year have actually been rather good. Short tracks continue to be a massive struggle with this car. And we're not getting a thousand horsepower, right? So Tires are realistically the only change that they're going to be able to make, barring some sort of major aero change, which doesn't sound like it's happening. And to continually go to these short tracks, which used to be NASCAR's bread and butter. This used to be the place where you would pack fans in. 120,000 people showed up for Bristol on Saturday night, though, so that's great. Didn't hear anybody complaining about attendance this time around. Regardless, we need better out of Goodyear, and I know that they're probably working on it, right? They don't want to see what happened happen again either, but at the same time, we don't need Tony Stewart remembering that he was in NASCAR before coming back and telling us how we need to get Hoosier in here because that's not going to fix any of the problems. NASCAR and Goodyear go hand in hand. They need to work together to create a more consistent tire and one that actually wears. Ten years ago, NASCAR Cup Series teams received charters from the governing body. 
today, Monday, September 23rd, had to look down at the calendar to see what the date was there. IndyCar has also issued their own charters for the first time in IndyCar history. 25 chartered teams now own, well, a charter, essentially. They got a piece of paper that guarantees them entry to every IndyCar race except for the Indianapolis 500. You still have to qualify on speed. You can still go home. Does not matter who you are. Go fast or go home. Respect the traditions. I'm glad IndyCar did that. I know Zach Brown doesn't like it. Too bad. This is the tradition of the Indianapolis 500. If you're not fast, go ahead and pack up and head back to the shop because the fastest 33 deserve to start this race. Does not matter who you are. So I'm glad that they went ahead and did that. At the same time, there's 22 spots in the leader circle, which guarantees the charter teams, well, 22 of the 25, will get leader circle payout. The other three, eh, not so much. How much are these charters worth? Well, they're all given to the teams, although Roger Penske and Penske Entertainment wanted the teams to buy these, and which the response from the teams was, well, we're not doing that, and they got laughed out of the room. In that situation, they're all given to the teams. A maximum of three charters are, be able, are able to be held by the team. So Chip Ganassi Racing has three, Aaron McLaren has three, Andretti Autosport has three, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan, has three and era mclaren has three as well and then there's a couple of teams with two out there uh, the remaining teams all have two uh charters how much is a charter worth well right now according to sports business journals some people in the industry think that they're worth six figures some people think that they're worth the low seven figures certainly not anywhere in the uh, 30 million dollar range like nascar's current charters are but maybe that will go up um, in the future. There is one team out there, Prema, that is coming over to IndyCar for the first time next season that is looking to purchase charters. Who could be selling them? Remains up in the air at this point. Obviously, Dale Coyne is the guy that you think might be, but it doesn't sound like he is either. Um, obviously, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan is, has three cars. Will they have three drivers there next year? That remains up in the air at the moment. So for now, IndyCar gets a charter system. Does it make IndyCar more appealing to investors? Anybody like that? I'm not quite sure. Zach Brown, in his sort of state of the sport that he posted a, you know, a couple weeks ago, he has openly talked about the charter system not really doing much for him. And I just envision him being like Charlie Day and Always Sunny, where he gets the charters and he's like, what do now? What do now? Like, essentially, what is this going to do for us? Nothing, because they're great at bringing in sponsors over at Air McLaren. I mean, they're so good at bringing in sponsors. They did a deal with Hunko's Hollinger Racing, where they're like, we have so many sponsors, we're going to go ahead and put some on your car. And then they went crazy. So they're like, we're going to actually cancel that deal there. But for some teams, they're not really that into the charters. As Racer.com reported, two of the teams did not sign the charter agreement initially, and then they were prodded by uh, Penske Entertainment, like their NASCAR, and they finally did end up signing it. Uh, what I mean, essentially, you're signing up to just get free equity, uh, hopefully, over the long run, and hopefully the value of those charters goes up for these team owners. So let me know in the comments what you thought about the walkout songs for the drivers at the Bristol Night Race, Goodyear, and their inconsistencies this season, as well as IndyCar's charter system that they established on Monday. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at BreakHardBlog.